Go ahead, Emily. Hey, okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Well, good morning, everyone, and I'm so glad to be joining you again. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for me. Uh, I really look forward to our conversations. And today in particular, we're, you know, we've been doing a lot of uh, procedural stuff and all that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the kids that you're going to be seeing and what are the things that are unique about each category of student that you're going to see. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about uh, improving functional eating skills for children and managing their feeding and also maintaining safety. Uh, so here are my disclosures, which I know you've seen many times. Um, okay, so let's begin with uh, managing feeding and improving functional eating skills. Uh, so therapeutic management, uh, there, there's um, several areas that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about collaborative con consultation, and that's for all students. We're going to break that down. And then we're going to talk about therapeutic intervention with our children with the oral phase dysphagia that we have talked about previously and with the sensory and sensory motor disorders, those kinds of things. Um, so we're gonna look at those kids and see what are we need to be doing with them. And then intervention with a child with a progressive or a medically fragile. So when we look at our caseload of children with swallowing and feeding disorders, just like any caseload we have in our schools, there's a huge diversity and there's different levels of uh, involvement and not so involved. So, you know, these are all children we have to serve. When we look at the progressive disorder, that's a little different than the ones with straight oral motor. So let's break that down and look at what are the things that need to be done a little differently for those children and the ones that are medically fragile. And then let's talk also about tube feeding because of course that is a swallowing and feeding disorder and it's managed through tube feeding. And so what is our role in the school system with that? And then uh, finally, our last one will be the behavioral feeding disorders, which I know are always a big concern for school-based therapists. So we're gonna kind of see what we can discuss together about the best ways that we can address the behavioral piece. Okay, so let's start with ongoing monitoring and consultation. And this is one of those things that, you know, several years back, it was a light bulb turned on. And I thought, oh my gosh, monitoring and consultation, the ongoing monitoring, that is like the most important therapy model that we do because um, it's how we maintain safety. So we've gone through all this work to set up safe eating plans and to train our staff and all that. But if we just let them fly, if we just let them go on their own, things will change, personnel will change. We must be involved in ongoing monitoring with those students. So every child that has a safe eating plan receives ongoing monitoring and consultation. And the reason we do that is we wanna make sure that that plan continues to be appropriate for the child. We know that many of these children will change throughout a school year. Uh, they may uh, get ill, come back after two weeks and really have different swallowing skills. So this is something that we need to really keep an eye on throughout the school year. Uh, we also wanna make sure that the feeders, the people who are designated feeders for our students are well-trained and that they're, that they are implementing the plan as we trained them and, and as it is written. And sometimes things can slide around. You can, you know, uh, uh, sometimes if someone knows a child really well, they may make some decisions on their own. So you wanna keep an eye on, make sure that what is being done with that child as far as eating and following the plan is being done uh, correctly and not putting that child in, at any risk. And then also uh, the cafeteria is responsible for the modification of the foods and hopefully that's happening in your district. Um, but if it's uh, the cafeteria or the classroom staff doing the modification of the foods, someone really has to keep an eye that those food textures are being modified correctly. It's, it's pretty complicated and you wanna make sure that uh, they understand what needs to be done, the correct texture, texture or uh, liquid thickness, 
and that it is being presented to the child that way. And so through monitoring and consulting, the team leader can really identify when their child is changing and when a revision to the plan is necessary. So some of the things you do with ongoing monitoring and consultation uh, is really monitoring the feeding plan. So that's gonna be going into the cafeteria or the classroom where the child eats and observing and seeing what's going on. You also want to share information with the swallowing and feeding team members and with teachers and paraprofessionals and parents. So all of that is part of consulting. So I really always encourage people to add minutes on the IEP for consultation for swallowing because it is time consuming and you really need to give be given credit for what you're doing. Uh, because we know that meeting with team members or getting uh, communicating with team members in any form can be uh, difficult and something that will take time. You also important uh, to coordinate services. So uh, when we find out something about a student, you want to communicate with your other team members and let them know, well, this child is going in for a surgery or this child has um, had some allergies develop or whatever is happening. All team members need to be kept informed. So working with your team to find out how are we gonna do that? Uh, and of course the teacher is an informed uh, team member and that she may be, the teacher may be the pivotal piece, but you're gonna have to figure out how are we gonna share all this information with team members. And then you can also provide feedback to the people who are feeding the child and kind of direct them towards safe practices. So if you observe them and you see something not quite the way you would want it, whether it's actually following the plan or the cueing that you're ho uh, hoping that they would use, then you can work with them while you're doing that monitoring. So it's, it's real uh, essential to keep an eye on what's happening as that child is being fed. And then finally, there's going to be occasionally, fortunately not often, conflicts where perhaps a classroom staff member refuses to follow the plan as written, or um, they're, they're just not um, complying with what they're supposed to be doing. And when that happens, then through the consultative process, you would involve the classroom teacher and then the um, school principal and so on. Uh, so this model really covers a lot of things um, and is extremely important because Classroom staff is trained to recognize changes uh, and that will be part of your consultation and that then you're aware of when these changes occur. In, when you do your monitoring and your consultation, questions and concerns by the classroom staff are answered as they occur. So it's fresh in the people in the, ther in the teacher's minds or the paraprofessional minds. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Just this is what he did yesterday. So that's real important too. And the implementation of the plan uh, allow and is monitored, and that allows for concerns to be addressed again how as they occur. So how do you make monitoring work? First of all, you want to train as many staff on the safe eating plan as you can, given that people are absent and there's a turnover in staff. So we always want to have about three people in that classroom that are able to feed that child safely. And and it might be uh, two paras and a classroom teacher. In addition, the SLP and the OT also know how to feed that child safely. So in a real emergency when three people are absent and there's no one that knows how to feed that child, the SLP or the OT could step in and help in that case. Um, when you're doing your monitoring, it also gives uh, the staff uh, a chance to communicate their concerns. If there's something they're just not sure about, or they saw something and they just want to run it by you, or if they have a good idea, it gives them that opportunity. You also can model appropriate mealtime man management strategies in how to fo uh, follow the plan. So that's a helpful thing. You want to check in often and review the protocols, update the protocols, and check the mealtime outcomes. Is that, our, is that child eating a sufficient amount? Remember, you know, earlier we talked about nutrition and, and dehydration. So this is something we want to keep an eye on because these children 
who uh, these special needs children with uh, swallowing and feeding disorders are extremely high risk for undernutrition and dehydration. So we want to take a look and see how much are they eating? Are they eating an adequate amount? Are they fatiguing during the meal? Do we have to make some changes? Um, so you also wanna develop a consistent method of documentation. Uh, I would suggest you use your therapy logs, but you might wanna make a special log just for when you observe the, the feeding and swallowing. It's, it's really up to you, whatever works best so that you know where that information is. And as you go in and you observe, you're also not only looking at what the, um, the feeder is doing, but you're looking at, are the utensils still appropriate? Are those working well for the child or does they need something else? Uh, is the seating system work? Is their positioning still okay? Or is there something we need to do? So there's so much we can do with consultative uh, collaboration. The next uh, type of student that uh, we're gonna talk about are our students with oral phase dysphagia. And these students really make up the bulk of the cases you're going to see. They're going to be, uh, a large majority of the students will have an, an oral phase dysphagia, which can be very risky, okay? Um, so therapy is done, treatments are done to improve both the preparatory and the oral transit phases of the swallow. And we're always focusing on, fo focusing on functional eating skills in the schools because that's what we're about. We're, we're about an IEP and self-help skills and helping a child to become more functional and more closer to their typical age and their feeding skills. Even if they'll never get there, we wanna move them in that direction. So exercises need to be specific to the child's weakness. So you, you conducted a uh, oral motor evaluation when you did the interdisciplinary. You wanna go back and look at those things. What were the things that stood out that we could work on to improve with a child? And you wanna work on those weaknesses. The exercises will need, be, need to be done frequently and repeatedly with fidelity. And what I mean by that is there was a study by Dr. Logan many years ago where she studied the frequency of exercises with oral motor exercises with adults with swallowing and found that you really needed to do two to uh, three to four 10 minute series, five to 10 minute series of exercises per day. So you spread it out, you do it more often. It's very similar to when you go to a gym. If you go once a week and stay for 15 minutes, you're probably not going to see any changes at all. But if you go every day for 30 minutes and you work on those muscles, you're going to start seeing changes in that those movements and in the muscles pretty quickly. And that's what we want to do with the oral motor exercises. Um, we, so we want to train the school staff, the paraprofessionals can do a, um, uh, the parents can do the exercises in the morning before toothbrushing, and the paraprofessional can do it before lunch, get them ready for the or breakfast and lunch for the meal times, and then the parents can do it again in uh, the evening, and that way that child is really getting some good strong exercises that could make a difference in their chewing and their ability to really manipulate the bolus. Um, we always want to take good, strong data to drive the treatment plan. If we're not looking at our data, then we may be doing something that's not working. And we certainly don't want to do that. So you have to give it enough time. But if your data shows no progress, you want to move on and do something else. Uh, Donna Edwards says that it should be based on clinically observed behaviors in the child and should focus on specific things that are functional and meaningful, such as spoon feeding, biting, and chewing. And that really speaks to us in the schools because we're, we're about functional and meaningful skills. Uh, Justine Shepard said that oral and motor skills should be trained in the order they normally develop. So if you look at a developmental feeding chart of an infant and on to, into the toddler, you can see the sequence of the development of um, where they go. And that's where you can go. You can start where they are and try to progress them forward. And as we spoke about in the other previous slide, the motor program really needs to be intensive and systematic 
with the goal being to progress to a more normalized diet. So working with the parents and the classroom staff and the therapist, the therapist really know when to progress the exercises and then trains the staff. So at this, this one, we're going to do it a little differently. Instead of having one uh, case study at the end, throughout this process, I'm going to be talking about students in my district that we worked with that pertain to the topic. So this Jay was a student that had oral motor issues. He came to us at four years old and was placed in a preschool class. He had been diagnosed with diplegic cerebral palsy and which is a really more severe form of cerebral palsy. The school was very nervous about him coming because of his history of medical issues. At the time he came to us, he was eating pureed foods. The mothers told us that she would put whatever the family was eating in a food processor for him, which is really a great thing. She was a wonderful mom and took good care of this little boy. He ate from his high chair at home with his family and he, she said that he could close his lips. He was able to bring food to his mouth once it was scooped into a spoon. He, he showed likes and dis dislikes, but he was not chewing. Of course, they were giving him only pureed food. So whether he could chew or not, we weren't really sure. He really wasn't getting an opportunity to chew. And he drank liquids from a sippy cup or from a bottle. So he was four years old, still drinking from a bottle was not a good thing. Uh, so he had a lot of good things going on with him, you know, being able to show his likes and dislikes and being able to bring the food to his mouth and able to close his mouth. All of that was important uh, in where we needed to go with him. So we refer, he was referred to the swallowing and feeding team and a safe eating plan was established. The plan included that he would continue on puree foods uh, at, like he has been eating at home, but that the SLP would do therapeutic trials by, uh, for foods with more texture. So we would give him puree at lunch because we wanted him to get that nutrition, but then therapeutically, we would try moist and minced foods and see if he could tolerate some texture in his food. We also did one-on-one -on -one monitoring by the classroom paraprofessional during all his mealtimes and snacks um, because we still were a little concerned about risk factors for him. He, he was eating in the school cafeteria in his wheelchair. So uh, he was able to roll right up to the table and have the table right in front of him. Um, the uh, physical therapist had already worked on correct positioning for Jay. So he's in a good position where he could roll right up to the table. He was uh, in a prone position. Um, he, I mean, he was upright and his head was level. It was good. And so what we did for Jay is that we decided to work on transitioning from the sippy cup and the bottle to straw drinking. We felt this was more uh, age appropriate. His peers were all drinking milk from the straw, you know, their milk from the straw and, or their juice. And we felt that this would be a good uh, goal for him. We provided, uh, the occupational therapist provided a suction bowl and a curved spoon so that he could begin self-scooping and um, that was very successful for him. And then the SLP did therapeutic information intervention to improve his oral motor skills for eating and functional skills such as chewing, biting, and lip closer. One of the methods she used with him was the Beckman uh, oral motor program, <clears throat> which is a uh, more passive therapist manipulated program. And he responded very well to that. So what happened with him? Well, he continues to attend school. He's in general education classes because uh, Jay's a smart little guy. Um, he does have a prayer professional with him that accompanies him to all his classes to help him with his motor skills. He is now on a soft and bite-sized diet from the school cafeteria, which is a two-step upgrade from the puree. What we found is that he just had never really been exposed to chewing. So as we gradually started adding a little texture to his food, he really responded extremely well. And the last time I observed Jay, he was eating a muffin, 
which, you know, those can be very crumbly and can be risky for some kids. And he handled it beautiful, took a sip from his milk when he needed it uh, with the straw. And um, it, it was a it was great to see he was at the table with his peers. They all wanted to sit next to him and he was doing so well. So there's so many things we can do to make these children fit into their environment and to really be closer to more typical experience at school. <clears throat> so some of the milestones and sequences for eating development that uh, you might wanna address would be a transition between the types of foods, liquids to soft solids to chewable. That's how babies develop. Um, so we would go soft solids to chewable and then to more le difficult levels, uh, levels of difficulty. We want to remember how important it is that if a child can chew, we need to give them chewable foods. It's so uh, such a secure thing for us to put a child on uh, puree and know that they'll get a lot of food in a short amount of time and that they, they won't choke but they're children and they need to use those oral motor skills in order to be able to chew later in life. So we really have to put on our professional cap and really determine what level of chewing can they tolerate and how can we progress them forward. And by doing that, we are really helping a child to become a more functional human being later in life when they leave school. You also wanna look at the types of utensils. And of course, for, for OTs, I don't need to tell you this. There's all kinds of different bottles and cups and spoons and forks and, and things that we can use that will help them make up for some of those uh, motoric difficulties that they have and will help them to really be able to self-feed. Um, so uh, you always, you wanna take a look at those things. And then we wanna look at independence. Can they feed with their fingers if they can't do a spoon? Can they use utensils independently? Um, can they decide when to take a drink or not? So we really wanna take a look at what, what is possible with them and think, well, what can, where, can we, where do we want this child to be? What do we think is possible for this child? So the oral phase structures and their roles. So when we look at our lips, it's very important that the lips close on a spoon or a straw or a cup for efficient intake. Without lip closure, there isn't the pressure that you need to propel the food back. If you've ever tried to take a sip of water with your mouth open, not allowing yourself to close it, it's really hard because you don't have that intraoral pressure to propel it back. Take, try that after the session and you'll better understand how some of our kids that have that open mouth posture just have such a hard time getting enough food in. And so lip closure, working on lip closure is such an important thing for these children. Uh, the jaw, of course, the horizontal, vertical and rotary, rotary, rotary jaw movements are necessary for effective chewing and biting. So we want to help children to develop those skills. And we have seen using a number of different programs, um, like I mentioned, uh, the Beck Deborah Beckman's program. We also use Lori Oberlin's um, oral sensory motor program and we're very successful in making some positive changes for children in the area of chewing and uh, you know rotary chewing and um, uh, the, you know, being able to really manipulate that bolus. So you might start with chewy tubes and then move into uh, foods. And then the cheeks, when the cheeks have normal tone, they remain tight against the gums, keeping the bolus from falling into the lateral sulci. That's their role. And the tongue, of course, lateralizes to place a bolus on the lateral chewing surface and then returns the bolus. So we go back and forth with our food in our mouth to break it up and put it. And so working with that with children can be very beneficial. So as we look at what we're gonna work with, uh, work on with our children with oral phase dysphagia, um, we're gonna, ta I talked about feeding independence and a more normalized diet. So spoon feeding, biting, lip closure, chewing, drink to bite ratio, swallowing before taking another bite. These all sound kind of uh, not that complicated, but 
honestly, they make a huge difference. The child knowing how much to put on the utensil when he's eating and the amount of chewing he needs to do before swallowing and then alternating different foods. These are all things we can work on in the schools that can help this child to become a more functional uh, independent eater. So some of the tools that we have available to us is oral massage. And what that does is it may be used to increase oral awareness and decrease tonic bite, uh, decrease the hyperactive gag reflex and decrease tooth grinding. So oral massage can be really helpful for our kind of hypertone kids. Um, vibration and oral stimulation. We uh, use the Z-Vibe quite a bit in our therapy. Uh, it can be used to desensitize or to wake up muscles of the oral mechanism. When we did our jaw work, we started with um, uh, the chewy tubes and then went to uh, food wrapped in cheese cloth that the child could still chew and then could flip over to the other side of their mouth. The therapist manipulated exercises, those are the ones I was just talking about with Beckman. And what they do is they provide assisted movement by the therapist to the child. So this is really um, improving the muscle tone outwardly, manually. And uh, it's really helpful for students who really can't follow oral directions and aren't able to do what you tell them to do. And it can help to desensitize oral defense, orally defensive children. Now, the thing with this program is that it takes extensive training. And I think it's about a three or a four day training. It's fairly expensive and intense. Um, so what we did in my district is we sent a couple people to it and they learned the, the process and then we tr trained our uh, therapists for some, you know, it wasn't the official training, but it was something they could do that would be helpful to students. And then specificity of learning. And this is something that really, I think comes out of the physical therapy realm, but it's really working on um, skills that most closely approximate the things that you want them to be able to do. So if you want them to be able to chew, then you wanna work on things that require them to chew. So in other words, you wanna work not just with say chew, chewy tooth, but you wanna work with real food that has texture and taste and that that's where you're going to see the most progress so if you want the child to chew he has to up and so we can start with very um, dissolvable barely chewable foods and move into uh, more texture so these are the two programs i have mentioned and i gave you a link to that so that if you want to look into that uh, I know the sensory motor approach by Lori Overlin, I, that's through Talk Tools, and I know they have a virtual course that you can take, um, and they have a book that goes with it. And I've had actually had people in my sessions tell me, well, I use this and it's been really good. So it's not just my district, but other districts have been using it and I found it helpful. So where does evaluation end and intervention begin? Because we talked a lot in previous sessions about evaluating a child, doing the food trials and observing them and determining what texture they could uh, tolerate, what was the best one for them. But the, the whole process of identifying a swallowing feeding disorder, implementing the safe plan, it's really dynamic with intervention and therapy kind of melding together. Um, so the implementation, what we found was the implementation of the plan actually becomes part of the therapeutic process and involves ongoing evaluation as we're doing it. Joan Arvidson said, I find it impossible to separate evaluation from intervention. Whenever I'm working with a child, I am constantly reevaluating. It is an ongoing interactive process. And I believe that too. Uh, so hey, Willard, uh, we have a question in the chat. Oh, sure. Uh, wondering, can we post, uh, put the link to uh, the, the book? Is I'm, And I'm believing you're talking about Lori Overland's mm -hmm. um, course. Yes. Can you do what? Um, so Hannah would like to know, can you send the name of the sensory motor course in the chat? So I think some people are putting links into the chat from Talk Tools. 
Oh, and not finding it. Okay. I think um, that there are some links here. So he has a link for uh, one for very small children. That's not the one you want. <clears throat> the one you want is the one for older children. Um, and I don't, I don't really have that in front of me. Um, I would have to do what they're doing. Okay. Well, some people are sharing in the chat and if, if others find a different link for that, feel free, free to uh, share in the chat as we go along. Yeah. Let us know if you find it. it's a, it's just, you know how those websites can be. It's just really looking around. I think using her name and um, let me see, I have her book. Let me see if I can get the exact name of her program. That probably would help. Maybe somebody who will do a session for us in the future. Yeah, probably. Now, mm -hmm. okay, so uh, this is, um, can you see this? I can't tell because I can't see myself. I can. Okay, it's a sensory motor approach to feeding. And I think that's the name of the course as well. Okay. Um, and uh, it offers all kinds of information on very systematic information on how to approach these issues. I, I thought it was really good. Um, so let, let us know if you're able to, to locate the course. Thank you. And if you can't, I'll find it and send it to Deborah after this, because <laughs> I know I found it because I was looking and I thought this would take you right to it. But, you know, with links, you never know. OK, <clears throat> whoops. Oh, I went back. That's right. OK, so let's talk about Tommy. <clears throat> so Tommy was in a preschool class for four-year-old students when he was referred to the swallowing and feeding team in my district. He had low tone and oral motor, motor weaknesses. He was identified by our school swallowing and feeding team as having oral phase dysphagia that really did require some food modifications in order for him to be safe and efficient during meal times. Because remember, we want them to be safe, but we also want them to get enough food and nutrition during their lunch time, as close to that allowed time as they can, so they can socialize as well. Uh, and so efficient is, is an important piece of what we need to do also. So the team wrote a plan that included soft and bite side pieces of food. And I just, I just have to alert you that I'm, I'm using the ITSI classification system that is the future. That's where we're going. Um, this soft and bite size, uh, I, I don't have the comparison, but if you'd like the comparison, I can send it to you. I just don't have it in front of me. Uh, so I will be referring to ITSE's um, uh, classification of, of the textures. He also was recommended to have one-on-one -on -one monitoring to make sure that he only put a teaspoon of food on his mouth at a time. So we didn't want him to overstuff and be a risk for choking. Uh, he had, a re had to have a reminder by the paraprofessional to swallow before taking another bite. Um, so he was wanting to kind of just keep going. So they cued him to stop, chew, swallow. Then he could take another bite. And uh, so they, at first, they needed to cue him as to chewing at least four or five times in order to really break up the uh, bolus. So the school team trained his paraprofessional uh, on implementing the safe eating plan and on bite-sized portions, what that looked like, swallowing before taking another bite and the chewing, okay? In addition, they were taught, the monitor was taught to fade cues as he began learning skills. So they, the team taught him how to do the cues and then how to fade the cues. After a year of cueing, Tommy was only receiving minimal cueing during his meal and really was becoming independent. This was a child that I did not go out to see a second time. It had been about a year, um, but the child that I was there to see was sitting right next to Tommy. And I could not believe how much more independent he was. Uh, he was spontaneously taking appropriate bite on his own, swallowing before taking another bite. And he continued periodically to be reminded to chew a little bit more. But so through the training of the paraprofessional and the fading of the cues, it implementing the plan became therapeutic. And of course, in the schools, we know how important documentation is. It really needs to be collected on a regular basis. So you're gonna to wanna to put together some kind of documentation form for your classroom staff so that they can keep track of what the child did. And um, it really should be done 
throughout the process. Um, everyone needs to know how often the exercises must be completed. And if possible, the people should be trained by the same person. The staff, classroom staff and the parents should be trained by the same person. So there's that consistency. Um, now, before we move on to intervention with a student with a progressive disorder, does anyone have any discussion they wanna talk about with uh, students who have oral phase dysphagia and treatment? Is this something you are doing already? Are you, are you working on functional eating skills like that? Is that something you think you could do if you're not doing it? Um, or is that something, or is, are you really focusing on establishing a safe plan and that's it? In, in my case, I'm, we are doing, we do have a lot of kids with um, the oral phase I mean, the, um, yeah, yeah, and and we are doing very similar things. So, but the one thing that Beckman says that's a little bit different than than um, what you said about doing the exercises is she says not to do the exercises within like a half an hour to an hour of when you are going to be eating mm -hmm. because it could tire out the um the oral muscles and and motor control so yeah. that, that that's that's a good point that, that that's a little bit different of what mm -hmm. um beckman says and so that's kind of how i always work on training staff that that yeah. we're working now, have on you been seeing progress with the beckman exercises do you feel yes uh, yeah we did too we did yeah too. definitely it was um pretty remarkable yeah, I've I've got a um, a high school girl that we started a few years ago on it, and she's now pretty much independent, and she can do some of her exercises independently, which is wow. really cool. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for uh, talking about that. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay, we're going to move on with intervention with students. Well, Emily, I just wanted to comment uh, sure. briefly that you know we have across our state we have so many different models and relationships and partnerships with districts that uh, some of these things are going to resonate differently with everyone, of course. And I do hear a lot people saying, "No, we're only about safety, and mm -hmm. we don't do therapy." And, uh, you know, why do you study this? Well, partly because you need to know it and looking for signs and maybe additional information that might cue you into things, even if you're not at the same level of uh, support. Right. And what so I making like you tell, a better, a better um What I like to tell therapist. school districts is that it's a good place to start working on safety and efficiency. Uh, in the plans that that's really a good place to begin. But because we're working on ch with children and we have an obligation to self-help skills on our IEP, that eventually probably ther therapy to improve it is something we should be doing. But it is a huge undertaking and something that we can add to gradually as we become better at it. But I would like for everyone to kind of keep in mind that this would be something that would be real important for children. Okay. Um, so the and the other um, the other thing that I wanted to say is I do have a couple of districts that are saying they will not do oral motor exercises right now due to COVID. They don't mm. want that close con contact with um, with um, moisture. <laughs> so. I do that's, have a couple districts with that's that. That's understandable. We're in a strange time, aren't we? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a child with progressive disorder or who's medically fragile. The way we approach this child is going to be a little different because we're going to uh, work. We always work closely with the parents and the physician when possible, but it's even more important when you have a child with a progressive disorder or who is medically fragile, because we want to monitor and adjust to the changes in the child's condition. Uh, so we're going to monitor that safety eating plan probably more often and more intensely to make sure it remains correct. The goals then shift 
from improving skills to maintaining skills and adapting as a child regresses. Um, so the plan is revised, the classroom staff is retrained whenever there are changes. And of course, we try to have good communication with the medical team if, we, if the parents give us that permission. Our school nurse turns then into one of the major team members. And when the child's progressive disorder is really progressing to a point where the child is very sick or if it's a very medically fragile child, the, the school nurse may serve as a team leader. And we had that happen several times. Um, so when a child is constantly sick or suddenly becomes uh, ill, uh, you may have difficulty getting to the point that you feel he's safe. So following each illness, you want to observe the child's swallowing and feeding skills, almost like you were looking at them for the first time, and react to the changes by asking the answering the following questions. Can the student continue to eat safely at school? If so, what changes need to be done to the plan? Does a student need an alternative method of receiving nutrition? And is the student so sick the hospital homebound services may be indicated. These are conversations your school team will need to have with these children. So let me tell you about a child, Sam. He had, um, that's supposed to be meat, not mead. Uh, he had spinal muscular atrophy, which is a genetic disease affecting the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and voluntary muscle movements. The primary system the symptoms are weakness of voluntary muscles, um, those that most affected are those closest to the center of the body, shoulders, hips, thighs, and upper backs. And then spot special complications occur if the muscles used for breathing and swallowing are affected. It results in abnormalities in these functions. The muscles of the back weaken and the spine curves. Uh, this is a, a, a terminal disease uh, syndrome. They're, they're, so. We started working with Sam when he was in second grade, and at that time, he really was able to eat most foods. Uh, we were just watching him carefully. He was in classrooms for learning disabled children throughout his school career, and he eventually graduated from high school years later, still being followed by the team. Since his disorder was progressive, in the early years, his swallowing and feeding plan was adjusted on a regular basis, with his diet becoming more restricted and more modified. He was referred several times. We sent him several times for swallow studies, which would confirm what was happening. Was he aspirating and were his motor skills deteriorating? When changes occurred, the team then revised their plan and retrained the staff. He had a one-on-one -on -one aide with him throughout the school day, including mealtimes, really un until he graduated. As a junior in high school, the team requested a modified bear and swallow study because he, Sam was getting frequent upper respiratory infections. The MBS indicated that he was aspirating on everything and they recommended MPO. The physician recommended tube feeding, but both Sam and his mother did not want to get the tube. So the team encouraged them to follow that physician script and have a tube inserted, but they chose not to. So as a result, the district had to, um, we could not continue to feed Sam because he was getting sick with each meal. Um, so he had to go home to eat his lunches and would come back in the middle of the day. Um, he, he did that for a number of years, a couple of years when he was uh, almost ready to graduate. He did get, um, stem cell treatments and they helped to improve his swallow and he was able to safely start swallowing again uh, about a year or so after this. Okay, let's talk about students with transitioning to and from two feedings. And we know we have many, we have children who have two feedings. That's always been the case. And we wanna share the information we gather uh, with the parents and the physicians to make sure that if they're moving to or from tubes, that they know what we're seeing. Because when you think about it, these kiddos are with us for breakfast and lunch, snack times. They're eating a lot at school. So if we uh, feel a child needs a tube, we're gonna wanna share that information with the physician. Also, if the child is really you know, doing well with the tube and gets oral feeding, we can give feedback on that as well. 
So we know there's many types of tube feedings that children get. The PEG tube, the J tube, the nasogastric are probably the most common. Um, they all use high cal calorie liquid food mixture, which contains proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. The nasogastric tube is a narrow bore tube that's passed into the stomach via the nose and is used for short or medium term nutritional support. Because it can be easily dislocated when the student coughs, sneezes, or any other situation where the student's moving around, it's really a temporary solution and not one that we would want in the schools very often, okay? If a child does come to school with a nasogastric tube, you, tube, you want the school nurse to be involved in that because they're gonna to have to monitor to make sure that tube is going in the right place. The PEG tube is the one we see the most often in schools and it's placed in the stomach and nutrition is received directly into the stomach. Uh, so the child can be on a typical meal schedule with the tube feeding or they may get slow continuous feeding all day or all night. Um, the tube feedings depend on state regulations. I'm not really sure what Oregon's regulations are as far as nurses and uh, in some states, the nurses must do the tube feeding, and in other states, they can train. It's a skill they can train up. It just depends on what your state says. Um, but the child on a PEG tube may or may not be an aspiration risk. So a child can be put on a tube to, to improve his nutrition, okay? If they're not able to sustain nutrition orally, but they have a safe pharyngeal swallow, then that child is referred to as undernourished or malnourished. And so that child may be given a tube to gain weight and stabilize himself. But at the same time, you want to be able, you want to feed him orally so that he doesn't lose those skills or that taste or the sensory part of it. So it's real important when a child is put on a tube feeding for undernutrition and not for uh, aspiration that they continue to eat. The other uh, situation, and I, this is something that uh, a parent therapist contacted me after one of these sessions and said that her, his, her son was uh, tube fed all the time, but it was for nutrition, but it was long-term. He was gonna be tube fed throughout his life, but he also ate orally and enjoyed eating or orally. And she was concerned because the school, because he had a tube, would not feed him uh, during school. So we want to be sensitive to that, that um, these kids, even though they have a tube, they can enjoy oral feeding if they're not an aspiration risk. So make sure you know and understand why that child is on a tube, what the risk factors are for uh, aspiration, and if it isn't there to set up with the teachers and the feeders uh, schedule of some oral feeding. So the other reason you would get a tube is that the child is at a high risk for aspiration that cannot be addressed with food modification, positioning, or feeding strategies. And these are the children we call MPO. They don't get anything by mouth, they get tube feeding. And then some children are too sick to get the PEG tube and then have the nasogastric tube. And that, like we talked about before, is temporary. So I want you to meet Laura. Laura was a, is a preschool student. She came to us with a continuous feed tube. Uh, she was just in, uh, I think, a three to five-year-old class. She was placed on tube feeding for undernutrition and received some minimal oral feeds while tube fed. She was not a risk for aspiration at all since she, she was in the typical preschool class at her elementary. Her safe feeding plan included pleasure feeds, but because she received continuous feeding, she was not very receptive. She was never hungry enough to really want to eat. So shortly after the beginning of school, the doctor said that she was ready to remove the tube, but wanted Laura to first get to at least 50% of her food orally. The parent really was not given information on how to wean Laura from the tube. So she continued the continuous feeding and tried to get the child to eat also, which did not work because she wasn't hungry. So the school, on the SLP on the swine and feeding team counseled the mother on discussing with the physician, setting up a different tube feeding schedule. Uh, so the mother went and talked to the doctor and what they did is they stopped the continuous feed 
she would begin each day with oral feeding of breakfast and then supplemental tube feeding at the table with the family. So if she didn't feel like she was getting enough food orally, then the mother would give her a little bit more through the tube. And we did the same thing at school. And what happened within a few weeks, Laura was really eating everything at school orally um, with her peers at the table and was having a great time. The parents reported the same thing at home. And so she was discharged from the swallowing and feeding team because she no longer needed the services. So just note that some students receive PEG tubes just to help with nutrition. And there are no dysphagia or safety concerns. Once nutrition stabilized and the student is eating orally, they can be often discharged. And it most typically happens with our preschool children, which is always wonderful when it does happen. So our role in moving a child from tube feeding, um, from oral feeding to tube feeding is to discuss with the parents and the child's physician, uh, you know, the, the decision lies with them, but the school team can really be a, a very strong information source. Uh, so you wanna give them the information we have of what we're um, observing the child. And now we've done this before and sometimes they agree with us that this child needs to move to a tube feeding and other times they don't. So it often will put us in a, a difficult situation. Um, but regardless of what they decide, we still need to work to ensure safety of the student at school. And if we feel that it's really dangerous for that child to eat, then we need to pursue our supervisors and talk to them about it. If a child's moving from the tube to oral feeding, which is always wonderful, um, we want to, again, consult with the medical team and the parents. We would want to have a medical script stating that the child is safe to return to oral feeding at school. And we do not have the total responsibility for the transition, but we certainly can assist and facilitate the process during school feedings. Okay, and now that brings us to behavior. So before I get into talking about behavior, uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? about the um, progressive and medically fragile disorders and the tube, uh, tube feeding kids that we talked about. Are you guys seeing these kids? Is this, um, is this what you're observing in your classrooms as well? So many of the genetic syndromes that we see are progressive and do present with a um, challenge. Okay, well, we'll go on and uh, talk about behavioral feeding disorders. Um, I'm curious about how you, you are feeling in your school districts about addressing behavioral or sensory motor uh, behavioral type disorders. Are, are you guys um, working on that right now? Is that something you're concerned about or is that completely off the table for you? I have several students that we're, we're trying to work on it with. Okay. So. I know sometimes school districts will get um, children who are seeing private feeding therapists and that ask them to please follow up on what they're doing. And so, um, you know, behavioral feeding disorders really have to be approached differently than those with a strict safety concern. Um, for one thing, they rarely occur on their own and often have other accompanying disorders, which really can affect the child's feeding status. They are treated by the core team members, which include the SLP, the OT, the nurse, sometimes the PT, but you might also include a behavior specialist on the team. So the goals for school-based be behavioral feeding is to, under to identify the underlying causes uh, of the behaviors that we're seeing at school, to work with families and physicians on identifying any medical issues. So we'll be an information source again to the families and the physicians uh, as they look into why this child is refusing to eat or is, is only eating certain things. Uh, we also want to identify any swallowing uh, concerns and to address them. One of uh, the things that, you know, I, I, when we think of behavior and autism, those children, uh, we really think about um, food aversion and things like that. But these children, the autistic 
population is very high risk for choking as well. So we need to always look at the dysphagia piece. We need to see, you know, they're impulsive. They sometimes have weak oral motor skills. Uh, so th they will need to be looked at for the safety factor as well. And we also want to identify sensory motor issues and provide intervention if appropriate and determine is a does a student have adequate nutrition and hydration to access their curriculum at school? So a behavior feeding disorder is when a child has a response to foods, liquids, or meal times that interferes with his or her ability to function in normal daily living activities, both at home and in school. It's when the child may have an aversion to food and even meal times. They may have a special education classification such as OHI or developmental disabilities or autism. The behaviors frequently associated with behavioral feeding is oral defensiveness, oral hypersensitivity, picky eating, feeding aversion, feeding jags where they only eat one thing, limited eating where they will only eat a certain amount of food, food refusal and vomiting. So your teachers and your parents may report that they throw food and utensils, scream or cry in the presence of food. There may be some self-injury, flopping and falling to the floor, all in the presence of food, are, are escaping, leaving the area, uh, closing their food, their mouth and head turning, spitting, overstuffing, aggression and self-induced scagging or vomiting. So general treatment goals when we're talking about behavioral feeding uh, disorders is to decrease the behavior problems at meals and to increase oral intake or a variety of oral intake, advance textures, increase the structure and routine of a meal time. And additionally, specific behaviors are often chosen and targeted for the increase, decrease or extinction. Uh, thus, a detailed, detailed behavioral programs are designed to address individual behaviors as well as to further the general goals. So some of these children are really going to be treated more by the behavior team than by the swallowing and feeding team. We want to look at that safety factor and get that, but then the behaviors, if they're associated throughout the child's school day, then it, that becomes more of a behavior issue for the behavior team at your school. So we looked at uh, classifying behavior feeding in three areas. Um, the, the bottom one is picky eaters, and that's a typical child can be a pick, picky eater, and they often are. And these are not children that we would see for therapy or that we do a plan in any way, shape, or form. And then we have the problem feeders that are more the children we would address and disorder. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those. Um, uh, the picky eater is uh, what we decided was that we would do a proactive preventive approach with this child, because if they're in picky enough to be reported by the parents and for us to notice it, then they had the risk of developing into problem feeders. So we believe always in being proactive. So this child basically eats a balanced diet. They eat from all four groups. They'll tolerate new foods. They may touch or taste a new food. They eat at least one food from most food textures and consume small amounts. So it's found in about 25 to 35% of typically developing children. Around the age of 12 to 18 months, these children that we've been so proud of them eating broccoli and, and all their veggies, all of a sudden become very picky. They seem to lose their appetite and start refusing food. And by 18 to 20 months, four months, they, they may develop a clear food preferences and exhibit some picky tendencies. Um, so with them, they do not receive direct therapy unless they're eating food, fewer than 20 food items. The district may provide consultative service to parents. What we did is that we um, provided a packet of information with general information on how to deal with picky eating. I think it was, uh, um, I, I have it, uh, it, it was uh, from the OT website, um, the AOTA website had a, a great list of what to do with a picky eater. And we put that together. We also made a list of websites uh, for, to give parents offering suggestions and a list of children's books that address the topic of picky eating. So we're just really, and those we provided to parents, but also we purchased the books for our preschool teachers to use in their classrooms. Um, 
Problem feeders, on the other hand, interfere with them getting a bounce meal at school and or sufficient nutrition, and it can interfere with academic and social problems. So the student may cry out or act out when presented with food, refuse entire categories of food textures, avoid one or more food groups, eat unusual aversion, exhibit unusual aversions, demonstrate tactile and oral defensiveness, run or try to escape. So it's, it's really amped up quite a bit, their refusal and their uh, behaviors around mealtimes. Um, so with the problem feeders, they may need direct therapy and intervention to really address the sensory and motor issues which may be contributing to the feeding behaviors. The district team works closely with parents to provide the feeding and um, behavioral strategies. And once the meta, and I don't feel like I mentioned this enough, many of these children will have esophageal issues, which are causing pain while they're eating or after they're eating. So they're refusing food because it's so uncomfortable. So the medical issues need to be addressed. And that's um, one of the key factor, but even after the medical issues are addressed, there may still be a learned behavior problem, okay? And so the OT and the SLP will address oral motor and oral sensor motor uh, skills to help to get them to expand their diet. Um, okay, so things to consider. With a problem feeder, from a medical perspective, they're really going to be looking at, is this child gaining weight and growing? Well, in with behavior kids, they often are eating carbohydrates. So uh, that's that's usually their food of choice and it's often white foods. Uh, so like rice and potatoes. And so they do gain weight and they do grow, okay? But then from a nutrition perspective, they may not be getting all their vitamins and minerals. And that is typically addressed with a comprehensive daily multivitamin regimen for them. And then from the educational perspective, which of course is our perspective, we want to know, is the child able to attend school? Does he eat what his parents pack him for lunch or what is given on the lunch tray, which may be modified? Is the child safe at school or is he at risk for choking? And are there problems with attention during academic tasks? So we're really going to look at the functional part of being at school. Are they able to attend school? Are they eating a sufficient amount of food at school? Are they safe and are and not at risk for choking? And are they able to attend during their school task? And so that will guide our decision making on what we do with these children. So guidelines for beginning a feeding intervention program is that meal times and food experiences should be pleasant and stress free. Parent, uh, Arvidsson says parental stress does not help a child to eat more. Goals should focus on, and that goes for teacher and therapist stress as well. Goals should focus on adequate nutrition and hydration for health and growth and functioning in the school setting. Mealtime environment may initially need to be quiet and distraction free for these children. We may need to provide them with a quiet place to eat and then work towards the cafeteria. And then finally, we have what we call disordered feeders. And these behaviors are so severe, consistent, and often have the potential of affecting a student's health. These children are eating fewer than five foods typically and are at a great risk for uh, undernutrition. Health risks are often present and the district team needs to work with the parents and physici physician to support a feeding program. Uh, so their behaviors are more severe than the problem feeders. Their undernutrition is below the fifth percentile and occurs more frequently. Disorders feeders can occur with other conditions, including cerebral palsy, autism, or developmental delays, and can affect the child's ability to participate in their educational setting by disrupting classrooms or just not getting enough nutrition to physically participate. And they can be caused by medical, physical, and structural problems, as well as behavioral and anxiety issues. So what can a school team do? Well, they can evaluate their resources and determine the level of intervention that they can provide. Uh, they may need to contract with the BCBA to help establish a behavior plan. Provide services that ensure the students can access their curriculum and thus protecting FAPE and serve as a support to the home and private feeding therapy and to the medical programs uh, that the students receive outside of the school setting. So here are some examples. A student is extremely picky 
And lunch consists of the same thing every single day, and it's very limited nutritionally. If this student is getting adequate nutrition to access their curriculum, then the therapeutic intervention really may not be needed. The student will take a school lunch, but will not eat anything or will eat only a specific color item. And they may be a candidate for oral sensory motor intervention. Student refuses all food and won't, won't go into the cafeteria. If these behaviors carry throughout the school day, then a behavior plan would probably be indicated and he would be referred to the behavioral team in your school. A student disrupts a class by running away, pushing food aside, et cetera. You wanna identify the food which the, food the child will tolerate and begin with that. Gradually add similar foods. It can be done therapeutically and reinforced by the teacher. So that's kind of the food chaining approach there. So let me tell you about Mike. He was a three and a half year old uh, boy with a diagnosis of Down syndrome. He was placed in an early intervention preschool classroom and had limited exposure to a variety of foods because of early medical conditions. Um, <clears throat> he was nonverbal, diagnosed with GERD, and it was untreated when he entered school. The swallowing and feeding team procedure was followed to establish a safe eating plan, and their recommendations were puree foods, thin liquids, adapted seating with foot support, eat with peers in the cafeteria, with options to complete his meal in the classroom, and ongoing monitoring to maintain safe eating. What we did for Mike is we did therapy to increase his tolerance for different foods and textures gradually. Um, they, the OT also uh, offered him a low flow adaptive cup to reduce his tongue protrusion, which worked very well. There was a gradual increase in the foods and textures and amount presented to him and consumed. Um, they did a tangible reinforcement system set up by the BCBA. So it was a real strong behavior modification. He did this, he got that. He did this, he got that. It was like that. And the parents were involved in reinforcing it. He did progress to minced and moist texture and began tolerating a variety of food textures. He used a cup for drinking instead of a straw, which reduced his tongue protrusion. And he began self-feeding once the spoon was loaded for him. The team worked closely on the, with the parents to follow up on GERD treatment with their physician. So that completes today's session, but I want to talk to you about the next one. So far this year, we've talked about what administrators need to, first of all, before I get into this, does anyone have any questions or comments about the types of students you're gonna see in the schools with swallowing and feeding disorders? Everyone's quiet today. I do Hi. have a question. Okay. Um, I'm, my name is Mary Ellen and I'm an OT. Um, and the behavioral feeding that you just got finished reviewing, that, that was really helpful. And it makes me wonder if there's any courses out there that help support that information to spend um, a little bit longer time with some specific strategies with that specific um, type of behavior. Uh, yes. Uh, eating. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, the, the one course that I thought was really great, but it, it's through ASHA. So I don't know if you have a SLP friend that you could view it with, um, but it's by Pamela Dodrill. And it, although it's geared towards babies, she goes through all those um, sensory desensitization stuff and all that, that that would work for our kids as well. And it was the most thorough explanation of how to address uh, behavioral feeding that I, it gives you the option of the straight behavior modification. And, you know, there's a lot of things about that, that we can't really do in the school, like refusing to feed a child unless they do something. Um, but they also go through the more therapeutic thing, more like K2 me does and, and where, you know, you, and more like SLPs and OTs like to do where you really desensitize children to their uh, version to food. Now, I think um, I would recommend uh, Sharif Fraker's food chaining book. Um, and uh, Jenny McLaughlin has a book called The Extreme Picky Eater. And I thought both of those books were really, really good. Um, and they helped me, although they're geared towards parents, they helped me and the schools to understand what we needed to do and how important it was to work with the parents. Because if we don't work with the parents, 
we're not going to make a lot of progress because they go home and everything's different. So I would recommend both of those books. Um, other speakers. Um, there, there is um, the get permission approach. Um, yes. and I, can't, I can't remember who it is that does that, but oh yeah, somebody just put it in the thing. March. March Klein. Klein, right? Yeah, that was yeah. awesome uh, because it's it takes a very um, gentle approach to introducing different new foods to students because I work with a lot of students with behavioral problems and there's been a few that we've tried more with the be the behavior like you're talking about you know you try this and you get this you know preferred food or you know some different things uh, along the line that uh, uh, bcba might do but um i think that that the other approach uh where you're introduced slowly introducing having them lick it and and yes. smell it and that and kind of stuff is also uh a really it's good much approach. more palatable to slps and ot's <laughs> than the other approach and and to be honest a lot of things that they do with the behavior uh um, modification approaches we really can't do in the schools because it would be um, it would be against school policy to to uh, you know manipulate the child the way they have to do so um, yeah I, I think she's another good resource for sure um, so thank you uh, any anyone else I almost think the behavioral piece could be a whole session on its own because it's so complicated and so challenging. So what I was gonna tell you is that we've talked about a lot of things so far this year. We talked about administrators and what they need to know. We talked about pediatric feeding disorders, that new classification system. We talked about using a team approach in your program. And then of course the procedure, we went through that. We talked about how training and competency and how to update skills and continue to learn more about this. And then uh, maintaining safety. And that's what we did today and managing uh, improving functional skills. The next ECHO course is going to be on addressing the barriers to establishing a swallowing and feeding procedure in your school. So this is really your opportunity to discuss the things you're most concerned about or continue to have questions about. Uh, after this session, I'm going to send Deborah a, a link to a survey for you to complete. I really ask that you participate in it because I'm really going to have you drive this next session. We're going to talk about the things that you still are uncomfortable with, that you still have issues about, um, or that you would like us to talk about. So by filling out this survey, I'll be able to plan for it that way. And I really am looking forward to having some discussion on this kind of stuff. So that completes our session. Uh, anyone else have any questions or comments that they wanna share? <laughs>